welcome to the Hawks Nest interviews with Seahawk greats. Today, I'm actually here with the legend, a man who needs no introduction, but I'm going to give him one anyway. He was a key member on the 1990 Colorado Buffalo national title winning team. He had played for 15 NFL seasons, three-time first-team All-Pro, two, uh, oh, sorry, two-time first-team All-Pro, three-time Pro Bowler, 1,000 tackles, 79 sacks, 17 tackles for losses, even six interceptions, even though he did most of his work rushing the passer. He's part of the renowned linebacker lineage that goes all the way back from Jack Lambert all the way up to now T.J. Watt. He is by far the best free agent signing in Seattle Seahawks history. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Chad Brown to the Hawks Nest. Wow, a uh, heck of an introduction. Uh, happy to be on with you, my man. Uh, it is a pleasure and an honor to have you on. Uh, and again, you guys can go check out Chad right now. He's on 104.3 The Fan there in Colorado. Does a daily show there with uh, Chad. Great show. Thank you for coming on here, Chad, today. I'm going to dive right into some questions because I know we're a little pressed for time. Um, you came here to Seattle. I know Paul Allen brought out the private jet for you. What, you know, did... What was it that sold you on? Was it something with what they said in the conversation on that private jet? Was it just that they really rolled out the red carpet? Was it even maybe something Paul Allen said to you that had you sort of, I'm coming here? Uh, Randy Mueller, uh, the general manager at the time, was certainly uh, in contact with my agent. So I won't say there was a uh, tampering going on, but there was definitely interest expressed, uh, you know, before Paul Allen's jet showed up at the private airport near my house to fly me out to Seattle. So um, I had some understanding of what Randy Mueller was trying to do, the team that he was trying to build. Um, and, uh, you know, the NFL takes money. And Paul Allen's ownership was obviously a, a very important part of the decision as well. I was leaving the Pittsburgh Steelers and, you know, bless the Rooney family. Uh, they are a family that just owns the Pittsburgh Steelers. They didn't make their money in some tech way like Paul Allen did or have billions of extra dollars. So uh, when it came to signing free agents, whether it's myself or uh, all the other list of free agents who had left Pittsburgh, they just simply didn't have the funds to do that. So in my mind, thinking Paul Allen's got essentially unlimited funds, um, that would give us a great opportunity to build an amazing team, um, to know that they had signed Warren Moon, uh, a quarterback who I'd played against and had certainly uh, difficulties against as a Pittsburgh Steeler when he was a Houston Oiler. That was a factor. The fact that they went and got, uh, were interested in my college, and uh, not my college, my Pittsburgh teammate, Willie Williams. Um, so not only were they coming after me, but they were looking to get other players who I thought had experience and a, and a great system, who were uh, you know toughened in the way that we were toughened as Pittsburgh Steelers. So I saw that there was an opportunity to be a part of something special. And in some ways, it mirrored my experience in choosing the University of Colorado. I had an opportunity to go to USC and more traditional powerhouse schools, particularly in Southern California as a Southern California guy. Uh, but I saw that Coach McCartney uh, was building something special up in Boulder. And I knew I wanted to be a part of building something rather than just coming in and being a part of something that's already great. So I saw some similarities between that Colorado Buffaloes experience and what the Seahawks were doing. Now, of course, we won a national championship when I was in Boulder. Um, it took a, a, the year after I left before the Seahawks got to the Super Bowl, but I certainly thought I was a part of building uh, where things eventually got to. Well, 100% so. This was a team that hadn't won for six years before you had arrived, and that's one of the reasons they didn't go out to free agency just get the best players. They wanted to get guys that could change the culture in that locker room, which probably needed to be changed. Uh, right, Paul? Uh, right, Chad? Uh, it probably was in a state of kind of bit of disrepair at that point, not like kind of there, like nowhere near there when you walked in. I'll give you a, a quick story. So obviously after the game, you know, the wives tend to congregate in, in one area. And it was the same thing with every NFL team. So there's a wives and family section. And uh, after the game, this was maybe game one or game two of my first year there. My wife is outside talking with all the other wives. And they're discussing the other wives with where they're going to go to dinner that night. And so someone asked my wife, where are you guys going to go to dinner? And she says, well, Chad's not going to want to go to dinner. We lost. And one of the wives turns to her and says, oh, you guys will get used to that. We lose all the time. And so my wife was just disgusted, just as I was when she told me the story, because, you know, I didn't I've never stepped on a football field in my life expecting to lose or being OK with losing. Uh, so the. 
Pittsburgh Steelers experience. You know, I was there for four years, won four AFC Central titles, went to the Super Bowl, went to two championship games, went to the playoffs every year. That's what I expected when I stepped on the football field, and that's what my wife expected. She went to the University of Colorado, as I did, so she knows that, you know, championships are part of what you do when you go out and play football. So, yeah, it was clear that the culture needed to change, to your point, but even extending just beyond the culture of the locker room, even the wives' culture needed to change. <laughs> or, or, or babies, mamas, or you know, maybe some girlfriends right. too. weren't quite all in there on that, but that's and that's what I, I, I like to, that you're saying too, because it's people sometimes think culture comes with a coach or just with uh, we'll get a quarterback in, or but it's actually something you got to slowly build, especially when it's starting from a point of scratch, which we haven't been in here in a while from Seattle that point of scratch, but that's when you walked in the door, and it's important, Chad, because I think a little bit of your Great play here in Seattle gets lost at that time. There were blackouts at the time. We couldn't sell the stadium. We were moving to different stadiums at a point. You're playing at Husky Stadium for a lot of your ball. And you sort of get lost a little bit in that, in that let's call it the darkness, our dark period as a franchise a little bit. But it didn't mean that you weren't, you know, really good. Uh, one question I want to ask you that's a little bit just about what I wonder in, in your own head and looking at your playing career a little bit. You go to Pittsburgh. They kick you inside. And to me, you're an outside outside three, four linebacker is really what, to me, you should have been playing day one of your whole career all the way. And please correct me if I'm wrong on this throughout. That was where you would have been at your best. Because when you were finally slid into that point after, I know Kevin Green came in a signing, then there was an injury. You finally got to play at the end of your, your time there at Pittsburgh on that outside. You've almost put up a de defensive player of the year type year. And then you come to Seattle and and I, I, I mean, I watched this tape, I've watched a lot of the tape prepping for this interview. They still had you as now kind of the off-ball linebacker a lot of the time. Yeah, well, you're playing some Will, a little bit of Sam. Sometimes you're you are rushing the passer, but I had I, I sit back and wonder, man, what would it have been like if Chad was going 24/7, coming off that edge, screaming off that edge all the time without the some of the coverage responsibilities there, and and that the team just well, we need you to play here. Well, okay, so going to the Pittsburgh part of things, um, I flew out to Pittsburgh before the draft, and I sat down with Marvin Lewis, longtime Cincinnati Bengals coach, who was my position coach in Pittsburgh before the draft. And we watched tape for me as an outside linebacker. He was viewing me as an outside linebacker. Now let's go even before that at the University of Colorado, I was signed as an outside linebacker, but Alfred Williams, who eventually becomes a Cincinnati Bengal and Denver Bronco, Canavis McGee, uh, those guys have just become coming off their all American freshman years at outside linebacker. So in order to get me on the field as quickly as possible, they asked me to move to inside linebacker. Um, and so I played there my first two years in, in Colorado. Well, those guys were on the outside being all Americans as they were, uh, a first round pick and a second round pick. Those guys leave, then I slide to outside linebacker. Okay, now I'm having this conversation before the draft with Marvin Lewis, and we're talking about outside linebacker. The day before the draft, Bill Cower calls me and says, Chad, can you play inside linebacker? And my reply is, hey, man, I can punt if you want me to. I'll do whatever I need to do. Well, we just signed Kevin Green. We're going to pair him on the other side from Greg Lloyd, and we'll slide you to inside linebacker. Cool. Sounds great. Whatever. Now, you know, I think there's a certain part of my personality that lends itself to this, hey, whatever's clever, just get me on the field. I'm going to do whatever I need to do to help the team win. But to your point... Yes, would I have been better served from a complete career arc, you know, beginning to end to have just played outside linebacker? Probably so. I yeah. certainly would have ended my career with over 100 sacks. That was a good um, question. You know, and that's kind of the, the, the borderline for Hall of Fame kind of thing. Do I get 120? Am I a shoe in for the Hall of Fame? Am I, you know, am I wearing a gold jacket? You know, probably. Now go to Seattle. In the first two years there, I'm with uh, first is Greg McMacken, defensive coordinator. Then my second year becomes Jim Johnson. He was not defensive coordinator in name, but he was defensive coordinator as far as calling plays. So I was playing multiple spots. My first year, I was Will. Winston Moss was playing Sam on the line of scrimmage. Then I, you know, great when Jim Johnson came around, I was a little bit more of a blitz guy, kind of an inside backer, not really an outside backer. Uh, the next year, uh, Fritz Shermer and Mike Holmgren come in. They like big defensive ends because they're coming away from the Reggie White experience in Green Bay. I played dime linebacker most of that season. I rarely put my hand in the dirt. So I had a number of years, not just in Pittsburgh, but in Seattle as well, where I was not rushing the quarterback. And I don't think I was necessarily used to my strongest suit. But 
you know, I've always valued coaches who take a look around their team. This is what I've got. These are the guys I have. How do I best put the best team out there? So um, I've always been willing to sacrifice self for team. You yeah. know, when I've coached little kids, when I've talked to other professionals, hey, at some point you're going to have to sacrifice self for the team, and that's just an expectation in football. Um, yeah. Would I love to have been Kevin Green, a 3-4 mercenary for hire? Kevin played for so many teams. He played left outside linebacker, not right, always left. He only did one thing, but he did it at an amazingly high level, finished with 160 sacks in 15 seasons. So there's something to be said for that. But I also think there's something to be said for my mindset as well. So I like to think I help my teams as best needed and where I best could fit in. At the same time, I would have been better served individually as a pure outside linebacker getting after the quarterback down after down after down. I'm glad you said it because that's where I was going to go with this as far as if you get those sacks, you get those numbers, everyone's looking at that, you're getting the Hall of Fame jacket. And this is, again, why I think it's important to appreciate your career from that standpoint because because you took – took one for the team <laughs> you because you you essentially did that dirty work i mean kevin green couldn't play will linebacker and coverage you know he couldn't do that you could so it's like well he can do it and he can do it well better than what we have already on the roster here so let's put him there i mean when i'm watching cheeky o'keefer for instance taking snaps and it's annoying it's a third and eight third and nine you know it's a passing down why is chad not up on that side there you, you like sinclair going where's chad there on the spot I, I just don't, it, it, it just boggles my mind. I know what they're trying to do and you're a good, a good soldier for doing so, Chad, but boy, oh boy, is it, is it frustrating in retrospect to kind of think about just a little bit? Uh, or, um, it's so, it's just, a little bit of frustration, but at the same time, um, I can actually honestly say I have played every version of linebacker in NFL possible. <laughs> yes. I played all the three, four positions. I played all the, the four, three positions. I played nickel. I played dime. I played Jack, Will, Buck, Sam, Mike, you know, uh, you name it, whatever ner- term they've come up for it, I've played it. So uh, it's a pretty well-rounded linebacker experience. And and you, this leads into a question I was going to ask you, because what I get on my channel a lot that I constantly am trying to correct is people will say, let's go get this outside 3-4 linebacker, and then we'll kick him into our defensive end as our pass rusher. We'll put his hand in the dirt. And I tend to try to lean towards saying, I don't think it's that straightforward with these guys, where it's as easy as transition as you guys lead this to believe, where it's just, it's ubiquitous. I can go 3-4, I can go 4-3. Sometimes you do one at one, you can't do good at the other. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, I, and I think there's a certain skill set. Now, the Pittsburgh Steelers obviously you know, have the, the, the blueprint for this. They tend to go after guys who were edge guys in college, maybe a little bit undersized, and then move them to the outside linebacker spot. So we know you can get after the quarterback. We know you can set the edge versus the run. We'll teach you the drop responsibilities, and we'll deal with that once you get here. And they have a pretty high success ratio of doing that. Not all hits. Not everybody's a home run for them. But when they draft these guys, they've got a model that they're looking for. We're looking for Kevin Greens, Greg Lloyds, Chad Browns, Jason Gildens, Joey Porters. There's a pretty clear track record of success and guys are trying to go after. Now that's converting from a defensive end to a 3-4 outside backer. To go from 3-4 to 4-3, that's a completely different skill set. As an outside linebacker in a 3-4, you're a go-forward guy. You're very rarely asked to go backwards. Once you're in a 4-3, and particularly if you're an off-the-ball guy primarily, you're asked to go backwards a lot. Kevin Green, Hall of Famer, rest in peace, my dear friend, was not a go-backwards guy. He was a go-forwards guy. Mm -hmm. Um, So it takes a different skill set. It takes a different mentality. And it takes a different vision. As just an outside guy, unless they're going to do a crack block against you, all the action is coming from the inside. Once you're off the ball and you're playing inside linebacker, offensive tackles, guards, pullers, fullbacks, tight ends, everything's coming at you. You need to be able to expand your vision and see things in a completely different way. Your keys that you see at the beginning of the play that give you the indicator of what the play is going to be are different. It's a completely different world. So I think it takes a very versatile guy to be able to do what I did and be able to transfer systems constantly and play different spots. It takes a very athletic person, but a guy with a great understanding of the game to be able to shift his keys and shift his responsibilities very seamlessly. Plays later, the reps trying to huddle and get themselves together. On third down, good call. Keyshawn would not have come down in the end zone on third and five, incomplete. Jets, remember, not down two, down five. Oh, my 
my goodness, it's a quarterback draw. Is it a touchdown? Test of Ernie. Stop right at the goal line. The Ray, no one signaled yet. Top of your picture, no. Bottom of your, no, it's a touchdown. The Jets, Parcell, Dennis Erickson can't believe it. Parcell says, Vinny, go for two. But that's not what the issue is. Here's the look. Watch the ball. Watch the helmet. And now they're moving it forward. Oh, boy. You know, they only have one look at it. All right, let's go to 1998. We got right, you're, you're playing the Jets. It's been an up and down season a little bit. You're, you guys are up by six points. Jets are driving down. Fourth down. I don't know if you know the play I'm talking about here. Yes. Vinny Tester mm -hmm. already drops back. They call, I don't know where they got the stones to call a quarterback sneak with Vinny Testaverde for game. They did. Testaverde comes down there. I've got a theory on this, Chad. You were right there. You're playing outside linebacker. I watched the tape. You're looking at it. You're pointing. You saw it. I think with Vinny, he had that permed fro, and it pushed the helmet up already a little bit on him, and he already had a big head, right? And so it was big head on big fro. From fro to cradle of ball, I think was 18 inches. I think the umpire got caught in the magic of the of, of that perm, and he didn't look at where the ball was, and he was short. Am I off on that? Uh, you know, uh, the the perm theory, I'll, I'll leave for you. Uh, was he short? There's no doubt about it. I don't think anyone could look at that play and say he got it. The, the, the officiating crew said they saw the helmet, which is ridiculous. The Jets' helmet is white with a green emblem. The football is brown. So, I mean, right. it's just, it just strains credibility to, to, to accept their, their uh, explanation there. Um, you know, it's unfortunate because that play, you know, of course, you, you, it's always hard to just signify one play, but that play essentially ended Dennis Erickson's, you know, uh, tenure as our coach. And, you know, Dennis Erickson was a great offensive mind. Uh, until Warren Moon got hurt, uh, we were a very high-flying offense. We had a, a lot of success offensively with Dennis Erickson as our coach. Um, so it changed the whole, you know, uh, direction of the Seahawks. Mike Holmgren comes in. So that play call was massive. Uh, it eliminated us from the playoffs and, you know, really changed the, the culture of, of the Seahawks with that one blown official's call. That's why I bring it up as I really am glad you said that. That was going to be my other questions with that was this, this seemed to be a call that sunk Erickson. You guys were on that role in, in football. I tell people the seasons is this, it is a marathon a little bit and it's not about when you're hot early or mid mid season, you want to be hot right at the end. And you guys were getting hot right at the end at the right time there. And that, that loss just, you could, you could tell you guys still, I think won a couple other games then face the Broncos. The question come in is if you got into the playoffs, you got three teams sitting in your way. You've got uh, Belichick and Parcells Jets. They're going to probably be there. The young up and coming Jaguars there with Brunel. And then you've got, of course, the juggernaut Denver Broncos. How does that team do in the playoffs if you do, if you guys do get in that year? I would have given us a shot against Jacksonville, and I would have given us a shot against uh, the Jets. We had the, the lead on that Jets, uh, that, team, that game, the one we were talking about earlier. We had the lead early in that game. Uh, Joey, uh, Joey Galloway was tremendous in the first half. Uh, getting behind the, the Jets DBs. So I gave us a good shot against them. The Broncos obviously were at their top of their game. That was, the, you know, when they had those back-to-back -back championships, they were very, very good. Um, Terrell Davis, the offensive line, uh, Alex Gibbs, the offensive line coach, and all those cut blocks, they were very, very difficult to, to deal with. I think I played the Broncos 11 times <laughs> as a Seahawk. I think we won twice, um, two for nine against the Broncos. Um, of course, you know, that's John Elway, that's Terrell Davis, that's Shannon Sharp, that's, you know, Rod Smith, who's not a Hall of Famer, Ring of Famer, Ed McCaffrey, not a Hall of Famer, Ring of Famer. Um, so the, the list of great players on those Broncos teams is very, very long. Um, so that would have been a very tough one for us. Occasionally, we found ways, uh, two out of 11 times, to uh, upset those Broncos. I believe they were probably were favored all 11 times we played them. Um, but that system, that Shanahan system, that's still operating in the NFL today, um, we just did not have the personnel to deal with them down in and down out. You guys were only – you did lose them twice the year, but both games only seven points that year that you played lost. Played them close most of the time. You, yes, you played, them, played them tight. And mobile linemen, too. They really bring in that zone-based zone stuff, right, mm -hmm. with the, the, the sub-300 pound linemen. Chad Brown. Fiber. Brown is so quick and agile that brute force alone couldn't stop him. So, desperate foes were forced to employ more fraudulent schemes. That's gotta be him! 
There's not a false start. I'm not going to call He can't. There's not a referee. Three false the start. Come on. Do you think we're honestly that undisciplined, or is he bobbing his head? I'm not going to call that a false okay. start. Okay. I won't complain. I know. They're not set. No. They're scared to death of you. So don't forget, I'm going to bring it from either side. Okay. Let's just keep okay. it with them. Okay. I'm going to throw the bear at them. They can't handle the bear. No, no. Yo, he's on! He's on! Ultimately, not even trickery could keep Brown out of the backfield. Another clip I'm going to be putting on over the top of this while we're playing before this interview is um, you're mic'd up and you're going up against the Annapolis Colts. I don't know if you remember this game where you're, um, I believe it's a game you knocked out Harbaugh, I think. You might have broken his nose in that one. Um, but you're mic'd up and, they, and the officials keep uh, calling you guys off sides because the offensive linemen are, are ducking their head. And you, you keep bringing it up to them. And you go, what do you want us to do? You think we're that undisciplined? And for, I guess, so first question was, did they finally stop calling the duck of the heads or did the guys just stop ducking their heads in the game film? Do you, do you recall well, that? Uh, so what happened with that, I think after that season, is when they put in the new rules about the quarterbacks with the hard counts. Mm. Um, you can do the hard count. You know, you can go hot, hot, as loud as you want. But the body motion and the duck in the head and all that part of it, that's when they changed that. And they really started paying attention to the offensive linemen and to the quarterbacks after that, because it was getting out of control. Um, so that's where that frustration came from, because it was out of control. And luckily, for defenses around the league, after that season, or maybe the season after that, the NFL changed and, and instituted some much stricter protocols for quarterbacks with the hard count. And then you went, you're on the sideline after that, and the, the the defensive coordinator comes over to you and he goes, "Yeah, they're they're scared of you. They're scared." And he goes, "You go, yeah." He goes, "I'm gonna I'm gonna keep running bare." They can't handle you and Bear. What what did he mean by that? You mean Bear fronts? So he was a Bear front, um, and you know Bear front puts uh, five defensive linemen in all the gaps, so all the gaps are filled up. So it really uh, makes you forced to go with some one on one blocking to deal with defenders. So if you've got a great front guy and you go with Bear front, chances are he's going to get some one on ones. And uh, I believe that offensive tackle who I was going against. Um, you know, wasn't, uh, you know, he wasn't Jonathan Ogden or, or Walter Jones or anything like that. So I was having my way with him and they <laughs> didn't have any answers because we were in that bare front and they couldn't double team me. Yeah. Well, my one question is like, why not run bear all the time? Just too much fear on the back end. Uh, bear, it has, it exposes you to some, some things as well. So, it, you know, yeah. teams want to go with bear if they want to fill up all the gaps, take away some run things, but yes, on the back end, you can be exposed if you go with that constantly. It may, makes sense. Um, so uh, Holmgren arrives. Did you feel like there was a siege? I mean, was this just building upon what you saw early on in the recruitment process where you got like this with Paul Allen's money and his investment and wanting to build this winning squ squad that I'm going to want to be a part of? Was I know you were think, talking very highly of Erickson, but was that a signal shift to you even though well, well, Holmgren's an, another, another game up? I mean, Erickson's a brilliant offensive mind, but Holmgren's maybe potentially a brilliant coach. Or were you a little bit just, man, we should have still been riding with Erickson. That was still... We're moving, and he he was did what he could with what he had at the moment where it was at. Uh, you know, I thought Erickson did a, a good job, but obviously, you know, the expectations were high because of Paul Allen's ownership and you know trying to get some momentum for a new stadium and, and within the city. And a coach like Mike Homer comes available with his pedigree. I understand you go after him, um, but the Mike Homer era, you know, kind of first year they kind of took stock of what was going on, and then they started to rebuild. So the Mike Holmgren era didn't actually get off to a super clean, fast start. Um, it happens, you know, the same way a lot of coaches do it when they first get in. You know, not do wholesale changes in year one, take stock of what they've got, see how the players fit within the scheme, and then in year two really begin to make some changes. So in those first two years, he did talk about rebuilding a number of times. Um, yeah. And in fact, uh, late uh, one season, uh, the, the year that we played the Dolphins in the playoffs, uh, we lost a game to the Jets on the road, and that kind of eliminated us from the playoffs. And four or five other things needed to happen for us to get in the playoffs. Well, of course, those four or five things happened, and we ended up getting the playoffs and playing the – not the Jets, I'm sorry, the Dolphins in the playoffs that year. Um, but in his post-game speech after that Jets loss, he says, most of you guys aren't going to be here next year. So, I mean, it, it was a wholesale change. 
And then, of course, 30 minutes later, he's got to rally us back up and say, oh, my goodness, we got a playoff game. I should have probably <laughs> said that. Um, oh, no. So, yeah, of course we lost the playoff game because it got off to such an auspicious start. With yeah. Telling it half the team, or more than half the team, most of you guys won't be here next year. Uh, I thought that was a real fail in understanding of the actual situation. Um, but those first two years were kind of rebuilding years for us. Not exactly General Patton there on that right, one, right. is it? On, on that. Uh, that's, that is tough to hear, too, because I my also recollection of this, correct me if I'm wrong, is a little bit of the young guys Holmgren brings in as then also the general manager. Were, while they were very talented guys, they were guys who at times didn't seem like necessarily they were, let's say, as all in on ball as a, a, a guy like yourself. Is, is that a little bit of an accurate assessment for maybe why that took? I mean, up to 2005, 2004, you guys, four, you guys were getting the playoffs, too. You're making noise, of course. But why maybe did take a little bit longer for Holmgren to really get um, his heels dug in here for what he was trying to establish? And you still there? Yep, there yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? You know, Chris McIntosh got banged up, uh, got the neck injury pretty early in his time with the Seahawks. So, um, you know, it's hard to play offensive line with, with a neck injury. Um, and then Lamar King, uh, another first round pick, you know, has a knee injury, never fully recovers from that. So uh, then uh, Marcus Tubbs, same thing, a knee injury. Early in this time with the Seahawks, never fully recovered. So some of those Mike Holmgren draft picks uh, got hit with the injury bug. But, you know, guys like Sean Alexander obviously panned out. You know, Corin Robinson, despite some of his uh, personal demons that he was going through with addiction and things like that, um, had some productive years as well. Yeah. Oh, and he did get some good guy Hutchinson in there. I would put too. It yes. wasn't all bad. It was. It was just in maybe that in the McIntosh thing. I think he didn't play it. He didn't play it down, right? I mean, it didn't. He had to retire even before. I mean, like training camp or something. So that was a a, a brutal turn um, to him. And a yard. Fake the end around and give it to Bryce, and he tries to stretch it out, and he'll lose yardage. Rob Johnson, who you saw earlier on the sideline, here they go again. More pushing and shoving. Chad Brown involved this time. Flags everywhere. And Kyle Mock didn't like it either. He's going to come over. Let me give you another. Let me give you another snapshot moment here, if you can recall on this. We're going to go to 2000. Okay, we're two days before Christmas, and you're playing the Buffalo Bills. And I don't know if you're going to remember this one. Um, I'm going to put it up on my channel though, so I'll have this this clip for you to to recall too. Um, we're four minutes into the game. Sheldon Jackson loses his mind on a pretty. Uh, just low key run blocking play doesn't go for about three yards in a cloud of dust and he's blocking you and he's pushing and he's pushing and he continues to push and you let up. You're obviously okay. The play's over with, and he takes you all the way over to the sideline, at which point you take him over with one arm and judo chop, throw him over the side of you. Then you get up over the top of him and grab him by his helmet. And I think you were trying to decapitate him. I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I, and I, I don't know if, I don't know what came, a head may have been in that helmet because you then took it and threw it away like some Roman gladiator who had just, you know, conquered his opponent. <laughs> uh, do you recall that moment at all? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That was, uh, I believe, the last game of the regular season, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Mm. And uh, it was, it wasn't a very good year. Do we end that season six and 10, five and 11, something like that. Um, so there was no playoffs. Um, I'm, you know, as disgusted as I possibly could be at the disappointment of the season. And, you know, if it's a football game, like I said, I expect to find a way to win. I'm going to show up and I'm going to play. But the frustration of the season had built up. And, yeah, the play is over. He's not involved in the play. I'm not involved in the play. I'm not making the tackle. I've clearly let up. We're even out of bounds at yes. this point. So, yeah, I had to let him have it, man. You know, uh, <laughs> What, what's the uh, the whole the old living color saying? Homie, don't play that. Chad, don't play that, man. Chad, don't play that at all. So yes, I hip tossed him and I took his helmet off and I threw his helmet. Oh uh, yeah. I took the flag. You know, obviously, you know, it wasn't going to affect our playoff standing, uh, but I had to let the tone be known right then, right there. I'm playing football, but homie, don't play that. Yeah, you got your money's worth. I mean, if you're gonna <laughs> get a moment, get your money's worth. Don't get it for just and, and look, he was legit blocking you into the sideline. It was, right. it was, and they were, it was far away. Um, well, I've got a couple quick hitter questions, but just wanted to really ask you one other kind of thing about, um, uh, just about the the scheme we're bringing in here. We've got a the Vic Fangio defense of scheme we are seemingly adopting. We've signed Sean Desai, a very good, young, smart, up and coming coach from the Chicago Bears. We're trying to get Donatelle into the picture of things here. He ended up going to the Vikings. I know, listening to you and, and your co-host talk about this on your radio show, that it seemed like Fangio, from a culture standpoint, didn't get the buy-in as a head coach. 
my question to you would be that do you think this four three under with the cover two shell and the is this is this still a, a viable model of defense or is it even a, a great model of defense to be putting in in this day and age there's a lot of respect around the league for for Vic Fangio and what he brings defensively and offensive coordinators uh, you know, week in and week out when they would do the press availability before teams play the Broncos, we talk about Vic's defense. And they always have very flattering things to say, how difficult it is to prepare for. Um, it does a very good job with disguising. Um, so quarterbacks are often uncertain until the ball is snapped, what the coverage is going to be. Um, Vic is typically, you know, not a blitz guy. I think last year they were either 31st or 32nd in the league in uh, a blitz rate. Um, so they often brought four. Um, so, you know, I think there's some pluses and minuses to it. Obviously, you know, Vic's disciples are going to run it a little bit differently depending on their own personal defensive feelings. Um, I think it's a sound system. It's a little bit difficult for some of the defensive linemen to play a gap and a half. That's how they get away with, uh, you know, with having some extra guys in coverage, asking their defensive linemen and those outside linebackers to play a gap and a half to be responsible for that. So not every player can execute that at a high level. Um, some guys can, some guys can't. Um, but it, it, it ends up being a very sound structural defense that I, I think uh, for the most part um, is difficult to score against. Teams did move the ball against the Broncos, but the Broncos had one of the better, better scoring def defenses in the league during the three years where Vic was the head coach. So there's certainly a track record of success there. In Chicago, he had some tremendous success. He's coached some of the greatest linebackers to ever play the game. Um, I did a, I actually did the Seattle Denver preseason game for Denver television. So I had a chance to sit down with Vic before the preseason game and uh, to soften him up to get into all my other questions about the game, <laughs> about all his great linebackers that he's coached. You know, it's a great interview technique. And oh, so, yeah. you know, he went on for about 10, about 10 minutes about all these great linebackers and all that he learned from them and all that. So, um, the guy's got a tremendous background, tremendous experience. So his disciples who run that defense, Brandon Staley out in San Diego, or I guess less now Los Angeles, is one of those guys. Um, there's a track record of success. It's very sound. Um, it's not super difficult. It's not super complicated. You don't see a lot of times guys busting plays and going, oh, I thought you had that guy. Is that my guy? Is that your guy? Mm -hmm. So um, it, it, there's a lot of just basic football to it. Yet and still, it's very difficult for offenses, particularly quarterbacks, to know if it's cover three, if it's cover two, if it's cover four, because they hold their schemes until the last second. Yeah, and it's what the opposite of we've been running here, which, of course, a lot of cover three, and they slid to our, our Carroll's big twist of the turn here this year was going more cover two. And so they're trying to, they're, we're trying to evolve here. It's a little, we've been running a little 1980s ish, but we're, we're getting up there, Chad, into the modern uh, defensive uh, scheme of things. So um, you think it potentially could work for us, at maybe with, you know, I know you don't have an insider knowledge with Carroll and what scheme he runs and how he's been running the players here, but from an outside looking in, in just general terms, do you think it could work with adopting some of these principles here? I, I, I think so. But, you know, you, you have to start to ask questions. You know, where does Bobby Wagner fit into a, a 3-4 defense? You mm -hmm. know, what what's his spot going to be? You know, is he going to be uh, as protected as he was in, in the 4-3? Not to say, you know, Bobby's, yeah, Bobby's on, on, on a Hall of Fame track for his career. So I would hate, you know, not question his ability. No. But, you know, of the inside spots, which one is he going to play? You know, and, uh, you know, are they going to make some adjustments to uh, keep him a little bit more covered up so he can be a little bit more free-flowing? Um, because there is some difference in that. And yeah. if you got a guy of his caliber, you certainly want to feature him. Well, uh, it's hard to really truly feature a 3-4 inside linebacker most of the time unless you put a defensive lineman in front of him and keep those guards from coming up on him every single play. Yeah. You know, they did something very similar when in Ray with Ray Lewis in, in uh, Baltimore. They played 4-3, and they also played 3-4. When he was in the 3-4 system, they typically brought a defensive lineman under him so he could roam a little bit freer and not have to deal with linemen every play. He then he had early on uh, Sam Adams and the, uh, the, the Tony, Tony Saragusa. The big, Tony Saragusa. Then he loses. Those guys retire. Then he gets Haloti in there near the end. And then he's back to playing. It's interesting how that goes. It's one of the I, I sometimes wonder, Chad, if not in a three, four, the most important part is that nose tackle and getting a oh. good one in there as above before anything else comes first. That almost is the first thing you got to take a peek at. And it's, it's a working theory, but I think about that sometimes with the, that track ray head. Um, well, let me, I know you uh, got to be catching a flight. Let me just do some quick hitting questions. These are just yes or no answer kind of things. They're just kind of for fun. Culpepper goes to the shotgun on first and 10. Pressure coming. This guy can really run. Oh, 
Oh. Stays in bounds and takes a shot. Chad, Chad Brown, Brown just leveled him. 3-4 or 4-3, what's your preference? 3-4 uh, and let me play outside linebacker. Let me get after the quarterback. Uh, let me set the edge. Uh, absolutely. You put more linebackers on the field, you get greater athletes, you give you more blitz uh, possibilities, more chance to confuse an offense when you're running 3-4. In the modern NFL, what's more important to do first first and foremost? Stop the run or work on stopping the pass? You got to stop the run. Like, that you have to stop the run. You earn the opportunity to rush the quarterback on third down by stopping the run on first and second down. If you can make an offense one-dimensional, no offense operates well in that capacity. Any truth to the rumor that LeVon Kirkland got over 300 pounds? Uh, absolutely true. LeVon was 311 pounds. Uh, that uh, year he played in Seattle, 311. He was splattering guards and fullbacks, but he had no shot when tight ends ran snag rack on. <laughs> yes, oh, that's awesome. Um, worst, cheap, worst cheap shot you ever received? Ooh, oh, uh, man. Uh, Kenny McCardell. I was in Pittsburgh. Uh, we were playing uh, Jacksonville. It was late in the game. Uh, it, it felt like he was like six seconds late. Like I had already started to walk back to the huddle. And he just blasted me out of nowhere. Um, Receiver. I, I held back from going into the Jacksonville locker room after the game. Oh, my God. That's ballsy for a receiver to pull that, that stuff. Yeah, okay. Cardell's not the biggest of receivers either. No, he was, he was live, very yeah. lively. Um, yeah. Dirtiest player in your time in the league? Ooh, probably Steve Wisniewski, Raiders, offensive line, playing those guys twice a year. You turn had to keep your, you know, your, your wits about you when he was around. Um, I certainly didn't like a lot of the tactics the Broncos employed with all that cut blocking stuff. Um, so while that was at that, at that time, technically not dirty because it was within the rules, I felt it violated the, the ethics of the game. And obviously the NFL has moved and eliminated that style of blocking. So those guys would always point to you and say, well, it's legal. And I go, but man, come on. We're, you're crossing the line. You're putting my whole career in danger with your technique. So wasn't a fan of that at all. And those, those blows add up to the bottom of your legs. Just because you didn't tear your ACL on one particular hit doesn't mean that isn't the – you mentioned you play at Broncos like 11 times. Yeah, how many cup blocks is that, 162 over right, that time right. period? You know, like that's that, that does add up. It compounds after a while. Um, most gifted player you ever played with? Ooh, oh, man, most gifted player. Wow, that's a, that's a fascinating question. Um Maybe I'll go with uh, Cordell Stewart and Seneca Wallace. Ooh, slash. Those two Love guys it. together, those uh, slash-type quarterback guys. I was always disappointed that Mike Holmgren didn't include Seneca Wallace uh, in the offense more. Uh, I know he's a backup quarterback, but he's literally the best athlete on the field. And it's not like you're asking a defensive back to go out there and catch passes and do stuff. This was a guy who had the ball in his hands every play in college. So he's not unfamiliar with this concept. You know, in Pittsburgh – Sometimes Rod Woodson, an amazing athlete, Hall of Famer, would return punts. So they would put him on the offense. But Rod wasn't an offensive guy. He was just a great athlete. Yeah. Seneca was a tremendous athlete who was also an offensive guy. I think he could have been utilized far more efficiently as that slash Cordell Stewart kind of role, come and play some quarterback, run some option, do some reverses, things like that. Yeah, and the two times I think in my memory they put him out there and did, including the Panther playoff game, he made a big catch in that playoff game. One time they tried him out there for Matt, and then they took him right back out and, and didn't go back to the well again on that with uh, yeah. with Seneca. It's interesting. Um, last couple of questions, promise we're almost there. What was the louder, Kingdom, Husky Stadium, or CenturyLink? CenturyLink, without a doubt. In fact, Paul Allen you know, had acoustic engineers uh, consult on the design of the field. It is literally the loudest place I've ever been on field level. Um, Kingdom was loud. Husky Stadium occasionally was loud as well. You know, playing at Arrowhead and places like that. But CenturyLink Field on the field level is in, is impossible to communicate. <laughs> um, best Seahawks team of the time you played here. What year was the best one? Mm, best Seahawks team. <sighs> Man, that's a tricky one. Uh... Oh, man, that's a tough one. Because we had so many close teams. I know. No one was none of those teams were truly great. They were always either trying to get by with Warren Moon with broken ribs or Matt, <laughs> Matt, Matt become Matt Hasselback yet. Um, you know, I suppose some of those Sean Alexander led teams with Walter Jones and Steve Hutchinson were 
propelling Sean to 1,500 plus yards, maybe. What What went through your head when Matt Hasselbeck said, We want a so, ball, we're going to score. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. That was over the PA system here at Lambeau Field saying, We want the ball and we're going to score. We want the ball and we're going to score. That was a tough year for you, by the way. You went through all these injuries, broke your leg in training camp. I mean, blood and guts year. He says that through the, the Packers stadium in two, 2004. What's the first thing you think? Well, in that case, I am actually in the locker room oh. watching the game on a small little TV with the Packers security guy. So I got a high ankle sprain early in that game, knocked me out of that game. You know, I was I had three or four tackles early in the first quarter, had a tackle for loss, was playing great, get a high ankle sprain in that game. Um, so I'm, I'm watching the game in the locker room because I couldn't get back on the field. My ankle was in too bad of a condition even to watch the, the game from the field. So it was a very odd experience because I'm cheering for the Seahawks. Obviously, he's cheering for the Packers. And as soon as he said that, the security guard turned to me and I said, oh, no, Matt, you don't do that. You do not do that. You jinxed yourself. You jinxed yourself. And yes. obviously, we all know the result of what happened after that. Hey, you did. I, we, I, I had the same reaction. It's one of those things. Don't do. You don't. Don't say it. Don't say in Lambo. In Lambo, yeah. Matt. Really in Lambo with Brett on the other. Really, really. I, I, I love Matt. You know, I spent a lot of time with Matt and his wife at the Hall of Fame uh, ceremonies this summer. Tremendous friend of mine. But yeah, you don't do that. Matt. <laughs> All right, last question. This is a fun one. You're going to love this question. The 1990. Colorado Buffalo national title team in an alternative universe all gets to come back together in 1991 and they take on the 1991 University of Washington national title get team. So you got you, Fourier, Pritchard, Greg Beaker, Dion Figures, Tony Birdie. You know, we got Entman, Cunningham, Lincoln Candy, Brunel, you know, Mario Bailey, you know, Napoleon Kaufman. Who's winning that game? Neutral site, Rose Bowl, by the way. Rose Bowl, national title game. Who, who takes it? Oh, we're crushing them. We're crushing oh, them. We are crushing oh, them. We good. were so mentally tough and battle-tested. We had the nation's toughest schedule and ended up winning the national championship. I, I don't know if there's a, a better endorsement for a tremendous college football team than that. Those Huskies teams were good. I played against a lot of those guys as – as pros, Lincoln Kennedy and I have done a lot of broadcasting together on the Pac-12 Network. You know, Mario is now a representative for the Seahawks, and I work with him with a lot of alumni stuff with the Seahawks. So I know those guys well. I like them all. But, yeah, we would have crushed them, no doubt about it. <laughs> it would have been a fun game to watch. I'll tell you what, it would have been much watch TV at, at the very least on that. Well, um, I really appreciate you taking the time here, Chad. I've taken a ton of your time here on this. Is there any kind of final thoughts you have just outside of a question, just in your your retrospect and looking at your Seahawks career? Just it, the, Or is it kind of you, the play stands for itself on the field and what I did is what I did? And and, and again, just the, the biggest thing, thing touching on this and talking to you is appreciating your career in the understand It could have been a Hall of Fame career if it was about the stats, about the numbers. If it was about, you know, you could have forced and pushed. And no, Pittsburgh, I don't want to play inside, you know, instead of, no, I'll do what you, what, what do you need, coach? I'm here for you. Um, is there anything you look back in your career and, and kind of look in that respect or is it kind of just stand where it stands? I've got very few, very few regrets about my, my career. Um, you know, um, I, I, I tried to put team first. Um, I, I tried to be, you know, the, the best teammate uh, and the most useful player I could be to whatever team that I was on. Um, I had a great career, 15 years. My career, you know, went full circle from, you know, being a starter the sixth game of my rookie year to the sixth game of my 13th year in New England when Teddy Bruschi comes back. I've seen the game, the highs and the lows. I've been a Super Bowl team. I've been a team out of the playoffs. Um, I've been uh, Pro Bowl, All Pro, some people's defensive player of the year. Uh, I've been deactivated for a game when I was in New England. So I've seen the game from all sides. It was a tremendous ride. Uh, my time in Seattle was great. I wish I had more success to show for it you know, on the field, uh, more team success. I certainly had some personal success, but I wish we had more team success. Uh, I still walk away pretty happy to know that I was a part of building the Seahawks into what they've become. Um, but yeah, it was a fantastic ride. And the, the 12s, um, the fans in Pittsburgh are incredible. Um, but the 12s are as diehard of fans as you could possibly imagine. I know it's hard to have perspective because obviously there are fans there in Seattle and every fan base thinks they're great. Um, but the 12 in Seattle are absolutely amazing. 
um, the noise, the, the, their ability to affect the outcome of a game, maybe the most unparalleled uh, fan experience amongst all 32 teams in the league. I don't know if another fan base is able to do that on the level that they are able to do that in Seattle. It's always a tremendous bonus to play at home in that stadium and have the 12s as loud as possible. Well, your your career was amazing to watch, Chad. I, I really am glad you came on here because I think we got to, our us as Seahawks fans got to appreciate what came prior that you helped, again, the establishment of the winning culture that we get the fruits of today. They grow ripen for a 10-year stretch of consistent winning football. That came from the Paul Allen ownership. And, and at the start of that, at the tip of that spear, was the signing of, of, of Chad Brown, trying of you, bringing you aboard to start to establish that culture, along with, as you said, Willie Williams and other guys. But you were sitting at the top of that. And it's it, we get the benefits of this today. This is it's, it, Yes, Carol came in. All, it took all those things with it. But it doesn't start overnight. It doesn't just start from like a flip of the light switch. It's a process to get there especially when you're trying to take a franchise up from the ground floor up it's already down to the studs and you got to like put in new everything you know so thank you for everything that you did chad uh, amazing player if you guys get a chance go watch some of his stuff on youtube there's plenty of seahawks games out there highlights of chad you can watch still pops off the tape you you undersell yourself on your athleticism and speed by the way i hear you in interviews going raza i i was the kind of guy that i'd you know i'd, I'd rush you at 30 times and you know i'm going hard 30 you're going to go hard 28 and i beat you on two i you were twitchy uh, they called you Gumby in, at Pittsburgh. You had the, the contortionist ability on the football field and the way you could move your body. They said, they said you used to break your shoes in Pittsburgh by kind of your cuts were so hard. I think you undersell yourself a little bit on some of your explosiveness and, and your ability too, as well. Cause I, man, you still want going back and watch this old, this old tape. It's still, it's still, whoa, who's, he, who's the quick guy there, but you know, running all over the field with his hair on fire. You know what I mean? So <laughs> thank you so much, Chad, for coming on. Anytime you want to come over here and talk, please come on over. I'd love to have you here again. Go please check out Chad, by the way, on 104.3, the fan in Colorado um, and uh, Colorado radio. I don't know the local radio, but please go check him out there. He does a the daily radio over there. Great stuff. Thank you so much, Chad. I really do appreciate it. All right, man. Uh, well, let's do this again. I'll take you up on that offer. Let's do this again. We can dive a little more deeper when I don't have uh, to run for a flight. Uh, thanks for having me on. Thanks for the kind words. And I look forward to chatting with you again. All right. Open invite. Anytime, right. Chad. What more could you want, man? Three and one. Chance to just go ahead and solidify the division on Sunday night TV. Everybody watching. The pain train is coming. Now, that would scare me. Now, hey, you know, not a whole lot it's scares me. That would scare when he put up his hands and, and growled, that scares you.